Hello friends, welcome to this video. Today I am starting a new series called the Draco Zoology Handbook. In this series we're going to explore the wilds and not so wilds of a world called Thera, which is very similar to our own but different in one key aspect. It has dragons. This project is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, combining my two favorite things, dragons and science slash animals. I've mentioned before that I love the Dragonology books as a kid, and it's always been a dream of mine to make my own version, to discover and study my own species of dragons and share them, and to inspire other people, hopefully, to do the same. So that's what this video and this series as a whole are about. Discovering and studying different species of dragons, and eventually compiling our data into a handbook. And if you would like to follow along, I have a couple of downloadable handbook templates linked below that I'll kind of explain more about at the end of the video. You can skip to the time shown on screen if you want to know about that right this instant. But for now, let's just get started. Today we are studying the common garden dragon. And while I draw this specimen found in a Therian community garden, we can go over some interesting details about these little guys. And of course, we'll talk about art as well. In any case, as the name suggests, the common garden dragon is one of the most widespread species of dragon in Thera. They inhabit meadows and flower fields, community gardens, suburban backyards, and maybe even a window box or outdoor potted plant if you're lucky. Common garden dragons are very small, maxing out around 10 centimeters long when fully grown. In addition to being tiny, these dragons are fast darting out of view in the blink of an eye, which makes drawing them pretty difficult. Luckily, all you need is hummingbird feeder, and they'll probably stay still long enough to catch a photo or a quick sketch as they drink up the sugar water, unless they start quarreling with actual hummingbirds, which is not uncommon, because these guys are pretty feisty. Another challenge in drawing these dragons is their second pair of forelegs. Their anatomy is unique, even among dragons. Their extra legs help them climb and remain balanced on swaying blades of grass and flowers. They also have long hooked claws on their wing fingers, which again, help them to climb. During a storm, they can dig those long wing claws into bark or whatever really to keep them from washing away. Like several species of hummingbird, these dragons sport bright colors and can even be iridescent. They molt their scales four times a year to change colors with the seasons. Their colors are oranges and reds in autumn, grays and whites in winter, jewel colors during spring breeding season, and greens and blues in summer. This means these dragons are remarkably well camouflaged in all seasons but spring. Spring is their time <laughs> to show off. They sing and flash their scales to attract other members of their species. The more colorful the dragon is, the healthier and stronger they probably are but they are also in more danger of predation due to those eye-catching colors. Then again, if they survive with all those pretty colors, they're probably good at, like, escaping or hiding, which are good traits for a mate. If they survive and find a mate, these dragons make hanging nests of woven grasses. You can usually find multiple nests located next to one another because these dragons are quite social. They'll defend each other's nests and even contribute to feeding one another's hatchlings. It's hypothesized that most dragons do this with groups of related dragons, so like their cousins or something like that. More studies need to be done on this, but the hypothesis might be pretty likely because many theories of altruism and why it evolved in the first place suggest that altruism evolved because of individuals protecting other individuals with their same genes. So if they ensure their survival of uh, an individual that's related to them, technically they're ensuring the survival of their own genes because that related individual likely shares some genes with the first individual. I hope that makes sense, but I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, speaking of feeding and defense, these dragons employ an unexpected weapon. They are venomous. And though their small, tiny teeth might not be able to do much damage, the real kicker is that they can spit their venom up to 2 meters. For a 10 centimeter long dragon, that's pretty crazy. Definitely enough to deter predators. 
And though the venom isn't potent enough to really hurt a human being, it will leave a mark that might be sore for a couple of days. On a scale of 1 to Honey Badger, these small dragons are not pushovers. They're more likely to swoop and bite than they are to abandon their nests if those nests are threatened. As for their diet, these dragons aren't too picky. They eat insects, fruits, and seeds, as well as nectar, which is why they like hummingbird feeders. Of course, uh, just be careful if you set out a hummingbird feeder for these guys, um, because nesting season might be perilous for you. They will bite you if you get too close, so, yeah. Life history aside, uh, now we can get onto some painting tips. We are at the part of the painting process where I try to indicate scales using some lighting layers and lighting tricks. Okay, right now, I am not used to drawing scales and I'm kind of not the best at like drawing out the outlines of scales. So I was hoping to figure out a way to just paint scales because I'm better at painting them than drawing them. Because if you paint scales, it's like one paint mark. But if you draw a scale, it has to be like a careful even arc and uh, I'm not too great at that so I tried a couple of different things but the process that I ended up on is painting in a soft light layer on top of my painting and just doing little marks and the color that I'm using in that soft light layer is like an off-white. You can see that I'm using the winter coat pattern, scale pattern, coat pattern, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, I did that one first and I wanted to remember how the scales go because I couldn't just remember it. I don't know why. So I'm like literally referencing my own drawing, which is kind of funny. Anyway, I just make an off-white mark in a soft light layer and that's a scale. And then later I go in in an overlay layer in the same color to add more brightness to some of the scales. So like where the light would hit or catch, it'll make the scales brighter than the scales that aren't facing directly towards the light, you know? So that's what I'm doing right here, actually. I'm painting in an overlay layer with an off-white. And then I mess with opacity and erasing a little bit just to get a better look for the scales. I think it worked out. Um, definitely let me know if you think this is a good workflow for scales or should I rethink it? Or should I actually just draw scales in my sketch like a normal person? For some reason, I'm like, that's just too much work and I don't really want to. But yeah, anyway, uh, I'm trying something new, so feedback would be appreciated. So now I will explain how to use the quote unquote field guide, aka the downloadable templates. So I made this which is the handbook entry for the common garden dragon species. But I also made this, which is a blank version that you can draw your own dragons on digitally. And this is the printer-friendly blank version. Just because the paper background would probably use up all your ink if you tried to use the other version. I mean, if you want to use the other version, you totally can, but this version won't use up all your ink. Obviously, you can make your own field notes without using these templates, but I figured I have them so I can provide them. It would be so cool if eventually we could combine everyone's, like, dragon discoveries into an ultimate atlas of dragons. But I don't know how many people are into, like, creating their own dragon species, so I don't know. I just thought I'd throw it out there. For now, I just have the blank templates downloadable and linked. But if you want the full version downloadable or a version with just drawings, I can do that too. In any case, thank you for coming with me to study these cute little common garden dragons. And just let me know if you like this idea of a series in general. I'm not sure if this was super clear, but for reference, totally make your own common garden dragon individuals. Their colors can be basically anything. <laughs> And of course, you can make your own species that live in Thera. Yeah, this is like an open project just for fun. So if you have any ideas for what habitat I should go to next, let me know. Which season do you like best for these dragons? Because they change colors. So like, which colors do you like best? 
Oh yeah, and species names. If you have any good ideas for species names that you would let me use, let me know because I'm not good at coming up with the name of the species. I mean, common garden dragon is uh, not super inspired, is it? Also, let me know if you read any of the Dragonology books because they were my childhood. Okay, okay. Rambling over. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video. Like, seriously, this was super fun for me to make. And like I said before, it's always a dream to like d discover quote unquote your own dragons. And I, it's just so fun. And the idea that like anybody at all would see this uh, is awesome. Okay. Again, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Okay, bye.